Hey everyone, welcome to the new video. So a few years ago, former Commodore engineer Jeff Bruett stopped here to visit me. He brought a bunch of really cool things with him from his time at Commodore. Now, a couple of them he just wanted to preserve them for his own personal use. Most of those items, he already let me upload them to the Internet Archive. You may have even seen them. Now, one thing that I haven't yet been given permission to make publicly available is his original source code from when he ported Wizard of War to the Commodore 64 in 1983. Now, the data has been backed up. Jeff has his original disk back in his possession, but I did retain a copy of it, and Jeff gave me permission to make this video. I thought, wouldn't it be neat in 2023, 40 years after he wrote this game, if I could build a working binary of Wizard of War from his original source code. So that's what I'm going to be doing. And I'm going to do it on all the original hardware using the same development tools that Jeff used in 1983, starting with this Commodore CBM 8032 PET. Let's get started. Don't get the wrong idea when I mention that Jeff developed Wizard of War in an 8032 PET. Without a Sid and a Vic 2, Wizard of War couldn't run on the PET. However, Commodore engineers preferred the 8032 over the C64 for writing code because of the more crisp 80 column display. And they preferred the 8032 over the 64 for building their code due to the faster IEEE 488 drives available for the 8032. I'm not going to cover the entire history of development environments at Commodore in this video. If you're interested in learning more, Michael Steele has a very informative article on his website. I'm only going to focus on what Jeff Bruett used in 1983, which was the Resident Assembler, originally created in 1976 by Michael Corder of Compass Microsystems under contract with MOS Technology Inc. By 1983, Commodore engineer John Fagans had ported the Compass Resident Assembler to run on Basic 4 PET systems. In this video, I'll be using the Commodore PET Assembler Development System, which was linked in the article shown here. Here's a look at what's included with the PET Assembler Development System. You can see that there are various versions of the Editor, Assembler, and Loader, depending on whether you have a 16K PET or a 32K PET, and whether you're running Basic 2 or Basic 4. I have a 32K PET running Basic 4, so I'll be using the appropriate programs for my system. With that high-level overview out of the way, let's dig into the details of Jeff Bruett's 1983 Wizard of War build process. So first, Jeff used the editor program that was part of Commodore's assembler development system running on his 8032 PET to write the Wizard of War source code. We take a lot for granted when we're using modern IDEs in 2023, but in 1983 just having an 80 column display for code editing was a luxury, and as I mentioned, that was one of the reasons Commodore engineers did their C64 development on 80 column PETs instead of directly on the C64, which only had a 40 column display. The second step was to assemble the source code. For that, Jeff used the assembler that was part of Commodore's assembler development system, and this also ran on his 8032 PET. Now don't worry, I'm going to show you all this happening on real hardware shortly. I'm just using these simple illustrations for a quick walkthrough here. Commodore's assembler does not output a binary. Rather, it outputs object code in portable ASCII format. So the third step was to run the loader program that was also part of Commodore's assembler development system, which would convert the object file into a binary executable. The fourth and final step was to test the code. Now, it's all well and good that Jeff did the code development and assembly on the 8032 PET, but to actually run the code, he would transfer the binary over to a Commodore 64, where he could finally run it and test it. This, in a nutshell, was the in-house C64 development cycle used by Commodore in 1983. Edit the code on an 8032 PET, assemble the code on an 8032 PET, load or build the binary on an 8032 PET, and finally, test on the Commodore 64, and they would just repeat this cycle until they were finished with the game. Okay, now that I gave you the virtual walkthrough using animations, I'm going to give you the real life walkthrough. Let's get this started. I got everything I need set up on the bench behind me here. The 8032 PET, that's where we're going to do the development, building, assembling. That has an 8050 disk drive attached to it for storage. The C64, this is where we're going to test it and play it. That has a 1541 connected for storage. It has an original 13, I think 1311 joystick, right? The one that uh, Commodore was sued by Atari over because it is a direct clone. We've got that connected because Wizard of War is a game. We want to be able to play it. Next, 
we've got the Magic Voice cartridge. Wizard of War had voice available if you had a Magic Voice. Now, what Jeff gave me, that's it, that's source code. I don't know if that was in process or if that was completed. I have no idea yet, so it may not have working voice, but I've got a Magic Voice here. I will try to find out. Now, with all that out of the way, last thing. I mentioned that step four was transferring the game over to the C64 from the 8032 to play. Now, how did that part work? Well, think about it. The game was loaded into memory on the PET, so you couldn't just pull a disc out and bring it over here. You'd have to at least save it first. But even if you did, well, I'm using an 8050. The disc format on the 8050 isn't compatible with that of the 1541, so that wouldn't work either. And if they would have been using it like a 9090 or 9060 hard drive back then, there's no floppy disk to transfer it over with. So what did Commodore engineers do? Well, I talked to Andy Finkel about this and I asked him and what he told me was he built a parallel cable and he connected the parallel cable between the user port on the 8032 and the user port on the C64. Then he wrote some code that sat on each side and it would transfer the, the data from memory on the PET to memory directly on the C64 using parallel data transfer. So it was really fast too. But there's a problem. That code is long gone. Andy said once they switched to building on the VAX in 1984, that code basically got thrown away. So I had to build a cable and then I needed code to make that work. But don't worry, I found a solution for that. We'll talk about that next. The solution I found was to ask my friend Bo Zimmerman for help. Bo is the fellow who runs Zimmers.net, and he also happens to be the fellow who wrote the Zimmodem firmware, so he's very well versed in communication protocols for Commodore computers. Bo told me how to build the cable, and he wrote UUPX, the Universal User Port Transfer System. So, while it's unfortunate that I don't have Andy Finkel's original transfer code available to make this video 100% authentic, I'm super grateful to Bo for his help in making this possible at all. I went to work with my soldering iron, and I made an absolutely beautiful cable. Unfortunately, despite taking great care to orient the wires correctly, I wired them backwards. This seems to be a trend for me recently. So I hacked off one end and started over, and I finally got it right on my second try. There's no code editing to be done here because Jeff Bruett already did that part back in 1983. So I'll get started here on step two, assembling Jeff's source code. I downloaded the pet resident assembler from pagetable.com, and I wrote it out to this disk. I'll load the basic 4 version of the assembler now. With the assembler running, I'll insert the Wizard of War source disk in drive 0, and I'll insert a blank formatted disk in drive one where the assembler will write the output object code. I'm going to pause here for a moment to explain what I'm doing. I specified the output object file name as 1 colon w -O -W -O The 1 specifies that it will be writing to drive number 1, which, you recall, is where I inserted a blank formatted floppy labeled w -O -W -O -B -J. I don't have a printer connected, so I'm saying no to the hard copy. Finally, I'm telling it to assemble a source file named link.nl. Now before I press return and start the assembly, let me show you around the source code a little bit so you'll understand why I specified link.nl. The easiest way to view the assembly source code is by using the editor program that came with Commodore's Pet Resident Assembler. I swapped out the assembler disk for the source disk so you can see the contents here. Jeff used a very modular design when he wrote Wizard of War. Every source file contains small chunks of code that implement a specific part of the overall program. Many of the file names are descriptive enough on their own for you to know what they do, like setup and radar. 
probably because I did C programming for a living for a few years, my eyes immediately focused on the main module, which I'm guessing is the module that gets everything set up and starts the game. Get is the Commodore editor command to load a file into the editor. I'm going to load main and have a look at that. Main is what I thought it would be. AT start starts the attract mode, GM start starts the game, RN start starts a round. Even if you don't take the time to dig into what each routine does, the comments and the label names, they provide pretty good clues. So if you're not an assembly language programmer, JSR is the jump to subroutine opcode. So JSR set vic jumps to the subroutine that sets up the vic2 chip, JSR clear screen jumps to the subroutine that clears the screen, and so on. When we listed the contents of the source disk and I mentioned how modular Jeff's code is, many of these subroutines are split out into separate source files. That's what we're looking at in the directory listing. Given this, there are an awful lot of source files that need to be assembled. The assembler program only takes a single argument for the input file, so it would be painful to have to manually launch the assembler for each source file and individually assemble them one at a time. That is why Jeff created the link and link.nl files. Link.nl is mainly comprised of assembler directives and not actual program code. If you're familiar with what a make file is, this serves a similar purpose. Opt is an assembler directive that sets options. At the top, for example, it sets the no list option. That tells the assembler not to list each source line as it processes it. This, by the way, is the difference between using link and link.nl. The nl means no listing. The PAG assembler directive creates a page break in the hard copy output listing and sets the title at the top of the output page. Finally, the lib assembler directive is the one that makes the business happen here. When the assembler encounters a lib directive, it stops processing the source in the current file, and it starts reading from the file named in the lib directive. Link.nl contains a lib directive for every source module that needs to be assembled. So instead of having to manually assemble each source file one at a time, Jeff just listed each source file in the lib directives here. So all you have to do to build the entire Wizard of War source tree is to tell the assembler to use either link or link.nl as the source file. The assembler finished. I'll run the catalog command and you'll notice that disk 1 will have a single file on it named wowobj. That's the output object code file that was created by the assembler. Then of course there are all the source files listed on the source disk in drive 0. I put the pet assembler disk back in drive zero. The last thing we need to do here on the pet will be to run the loader program, which will convert the wowobj object file on drive one into the finished binary. The reason for the loader terminology is that the program actually loads the newly created binary into memory as it reads the object file from disk. I'm not going to provide an input offset, so the loader will load the binary into memory at whichever location the origin address specified in the source code. Jeff used hex 6000 as the origin address.
The output you see on the screen is the object code input one line at a time as the loader is processing it. What you can't see is that as the loader processes each line of object code, it's writing the binary into memory starting at hex 6000. Now this is fine because there's 8k of free RAM from hex 6000 to hex 8000 on the 8032 PET. But what happens if the binary ends up being larger than 8k? Well, the loader will happily continue writing its output, but it will be writing to screen RAM. We'll actually see the binary on the display while the loader is running, which is neat to see, but it results in a broken binary. And that's exactly what you're seeing on the screen right now. This invocation of the loader is going to result in a binary that's broken above hex 8K because it's going to have the contents of screen memory mixed in. We've got a problem, but fortunately there's a simple solution. Recall that the loader allows you to enter an offset. That's exactly what the offset is used for. The pet's entire address space is from hex 0000 to hex FFFF. The loader program we're running gets loaded into RAM starting at hex 040F. Screen RAM starts at hex 8000. So we've got all the space in between there to work with. If we can just move the binary down to hex 4000, we'll have plenty of room. Unfortunately, the loader doesn't allow you to specify a negative offset. So what do you do instead? Well, you specify a positive offset large enough to wrap around in memory to where you want. An offset of hex 1000 would put the binary at hex 7000. An offset of hex 2000 would put the binary at hex 8000. You get the idea. Now, if you use an offset of hex 9000, the binary would start at hex F000 and it would wrap around on top of zero page at the bottom there. So what we want to do is use an offset of hex E000, which will start our binary comfortably at hex 4000 in memory. The loader completed successfully, so now I can load Bo Zimmerman's UUPX code onto the PET and on the C64. It loads at hex 1000 on the PET, so no worries about overwriting the Wizard of War binder that's sitting in memory on the PET starting at hex 4000. S slash R is prompting me to choose whether the code will be a sender or a receiver. The C64 is the receiver, so I'll press R. Once it says started, it's ready to receive data. Now I initiate the sender on the pet side. I'm gonna run the UUPX pet four to six program. When you use an offset with the loader, the loader doesn't take any relocation measures. So if there are any absolute branches in your code, they'll be broken. To actually run the code, it still needs to run from hex 6000, even though I told the loader to load it on the pet at hex 4000. 
So UUPX PET 4 to 6 will copy memory starting at hex 4000 on the PET to the destination address of hex 6000 on the C64. So the binary will end up in RAM on the C64 at Jeff Bruett's origin address of hex 6000 and everything should just work. Bose code changes the border color on the C64 with every received byte. That noise you hear? That's actually the CB2 pin on the PET oscillating as it sends data across the parallel bus. The transfer completed. The pet side is back at the ready prompt. On the C64, I need to press the stop key. Now the Wizard of War binary is sitting in RAM at hex 6000 or decimal 24576. How awesome! This is Wizard of War built from Jeff Peruette's original source discs from 1983. I see already that Jeff's name is there on the attract screen, and I don't think that's in the released version. I could be wrong, though. Also, in my excitement, I forgot to connect the Magic Voice cartridge. That's going to have to wait for another day, because this video is getting way too long. I'm going to close out with a few minutes of gameplay, so if you want to watch, stick around. If not, you're not missing anything else. I hope you enjoyed this one. Thanks for watching.
Thank <laughs> you.